Thank you, uh, Dr. Dahmani. Welcome everyone to day two, and we move on to our next session, the thyroid grand round. So in this round, we'll be presenting cases, challenging cases, uh, along with discussion with our expert panelists. So on the panel, we have Dr. Elizabeth Pierce, Dr. Ramzi Adjan, and Dr. Naif al -Busaidi. Dr. Elizabeth Pierce was the former president of the American Thyroid Association. Dr. Elizabeth Pierce is a professor of medicine in Boston, University School of Medicine in the USA. Our next panelist is Dr. Ramzi Adjan from the United Kingdom. He's a professor of metabolic medicine at Leeds University. Panel num panelist number three, Dr. Naif al Saidi, a professor at University of MD Anderson, Texas. Dr. Naif al Saidi is a well-known speaker who is a principal investigator in many thyroid cancer trials. Our presenters will be three presenters, Dr. Ashwak al Qahtani, a consultant at King Faisal in Riyadh. She has um, done a practice in thyroid cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering and currently she's a consultant in endocrinology and thyroid cancer. Second presenter is Dr. Ra'wa Sabah. She's a consultant of endocrinology and metabolism from Lebanon. She has experienced um, teaching for many medical students and young fellows in Lebanon, and she does have several publications in endocrinology. Last presenter is Dr. Zahra al Hamad. She has a board certificate in the MRCP from the UK and a fellow at King Faisal in Riyadh. So let's start presenting case number one. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, Congress and uh, to have the chance to present my uh, case that I hope you'll enjoy it. So this patient is 77 years old, female patient with background of uh, treated hepatitis C virus in the stage renal disease, both non-related renal transplant in Egypt 2004. And she had long-standing multinodular goiter that being biopsied twice and it was reported as benign. She has retrosternal extension since then. And you can see her CT neck in August 2012 and it showed this huge goiter with retrosternal extension and significant mass effect, but she didn't do surgery as the FNA was reported twice as benign. August 2021, patient uh, presented with worsening of her posterior neck pain, and at that time she has a pan-CT evaluating neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and unfortunately there was evidence of further enlargement of her multinodular goiter with findings suggestive of metastasis, and it was uh, showing significant disease. So as you can see, she has almost 4.1 centimeter liver lesion, up to 3.4 centimeter in her right acetabulum, and 2.9 in the uh, C7, and uh, two centimeter in the transplanted kidney. So she has extensive disease. The question at that time was whether this is renal cell carcinoma as her transplanted kidney showed this two centimeter lesion uh, with metastasis, or it is uh, poorly de or thyroid, uh, uh, differentiated thyroid cancer with metastasis. And to answer this question, before that, this is her CT neck and uh, abdomen pelvis, and you can clearly see the extent of her disease. This is the in the uh, CT neck, you can see the huge goiter with retrosternal extension with significant mass effect and it's highly vascular. And you can see here the C7 uh, lesion that eaten up her uh, C7 vertebra and you can see the pulmonary metastasis and this is here PET CT showing the extensive osteoidic lesion. So biopsy was taken from the transplanted kidney and subcutaneous nodule and both were positive for well differentiated thyroid cancer and her TG marker was un, uh, uh, unreadable. It was more than 5,000, and her anti-TG was negative with normal TFT. And her baseline renal profile, album creatinine ratio at that time were normal. So the question- Okay, excellent. So to our panelists here, so with this presentation, disease almost everywhere, what to do next in terms of staging and how to think of the next management plan. We'll start by Dr. Naifa. Uh, 
Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, uh, very interesting case um, with a little bit of a twist. So, here you have a lady who had a multinodular goiter and two nodules three years apart that were biopsied as benign. So, um, if we wanted to, to discuss a little bit where you know, then the patient has thyroid cancer and where this thyroid cancer came from, I think we'd need a little bit more information in terms of the imaging of the thyroid itself, right? Whether what nodules were, were biopsied and were there other suspicious looking lesions. Um, but to answer your question uh, directly, you know, um, the patient from the, between the cancer mark, the thyroid globin of greater than 5,000 itself does not necessarily say that it's thyroid cancer. It's obviously highly suggestive, and we already know from biopsy that the patient has thyroid cancer. So people can have very large goiters and have high thyroid globulins, right? They're usually not 5,000, right? But we've had, you know, one to 2,000 just from a goiter itself. So I don't want people diagnosing it based on the marker. Um, but you already have biopsy proven. So imaging typically would be um, uh, now we know it's in multiple places, so she needs imaging of the whole body. You can either do CTs of neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, or you could do a PET scan just to get an idea of all the places it is because she has multiple bone mets and you may miss the lower limbs when you do your CT scans. Um, and, and I believe you said it was differentiated thyroid cancer. Yeah, but it was well differentiated thyroid cancer. What about the whole body scan? So with an intact thyroid, a whole body scan will probably, a lot of the iodine will go straight to the um, thyroid. Uh, it's also tricky to do an iodine scan in patients on end-stage renal disease um, because they hold on to the iodine, but if you're using I-123, it's, it's less of an issue, but I, it's not very helpful with an intact thyroid. Right, so the biopsy, in terms of the biopsy, Dr. Elizabeth Pierce, do you wanna add something? in terms of staging and where do we start from in order to determine the modality of treatment, next modality of treatment. I, I'm going to defer to Dr. Busseti for this because she is much more expert <laughs> than I am in this area. <laughs> okay, so you both agree on that. Um, in terms of the biopsy, uh, so the biopsy was not taken from the thyroid, it was taken from a, a different tissue, a somatic biopsy. Do you want to shed light on uh, the importance of taking biopsy from uh, a secondary uh, site, metastasized secondary site, Dr. Albu Saidi? And what would that serve? Um, so I think you, you have enough information. Uh, I think it's good that you, you biopsied a distant site because biopsying the thyroid would not have helped in this case right now. Um, but I think you have enough information if you have this very high thyroid globulin and you have a primary site, unless the exception to that is when you did these staging studies, if something just looked very different to you and looked unusual, yeah. then one can biopsy. Rarely people have two cancers, but I don't, I don't think it's indicated right now from what you've shown us. Exactly. Right. So can we move on with the video? The question at that time was, what's the next step? Whether to go for surgery with this large goiter, highly vascular? with all uh, risk of uh, surgery or to go for external beam radiation therapy for her C7 uh, lesion and the right acetabulum or to go for radioactive iodine or to go for, for chemotherapy or it was too late just for palliative care. So the classic thing. So what would you do next, Dr. Naifa? So um, I, we didn't, we weren't given the information, we weren't given enough information that I would like to see, but um, basically you have a patient who has uh, lymph nodes, lungs, bones, um, and where else were the metastases? I believe that was it. Um, so in general, when you think about patients with metastatic disease with an intact thyroid, number one, you want to know, are any of these lesions going to get one in trouble, right? So instead of thinking of the traditional model of, okay, we need to remove the thyroid so we can then do radioactive iodine, so we can then, um, you know, and then do thyroid hormone suppression, we need to think, look at those images and see if any of those um, metastatic disease spots are going to get her into trouble and act on those first. Okay. So, so as an example, pain. I'm, yeah. Uh, Good morning, everyone. So just uh, for her lesion, she, that one which was bothering her and led to the, all the investigation at the C7 lesion, it was very painful and it, it caused severe pain neck. 
And she also have right acetabulum lesion that also was painful and it prevents her from walking. So this is the why we entertain the extendable radiation therapy to control her pain at that site. And the extent of her uh, disease was in the liver, in the transplanted kidney. And just to mention, her renal function was normal. And she has multiple osteolytic lesion and pulmonary with high lead lymph node. And this is the extent of her disease. So just to summarize, she has huge goiter with the compressive symptoms and severe neck pain and right acetabulum pain. Well, that's the extent of the disease. Um, so uh, can we move on with the video? The model of the, uh, treating refrigerated thyroid cancer is going surgery, red, followed by radioactive iodine therapy, followed by suppression with the uh, thyroxine. And some of the patients will need uh, redo surgery or radioactive iodine based on their follow-up. But this is not the case in such case with advanced disease. So the patient was seen at the time by endosurgery and deemed not for surgical intervention considering her highly vascular, very large goiter with more than 10 centimeter restrosternal extension and C7 lesion. The patient received palliative external beam radiation therapy to her neck, September 2021, five session. So after better understanding of the genetic landscape of the thyroid cancer, uh, many, many medication were approved and uh, showing good result in treating advanced thyroid cancer and some of them is highly selective and some of them are broad spectrum and for that the patient was considered for multi-kinase therapy so she had genetic testing looking for targetable gene mutation which unfortunately she did not carry out so her genetic mutation genetic testing was positive for hrs for the patients Okay, so uh, what do you think, Dr. Al Saidi, um, in terms of the uh, external beam radiation, five doses were provided to this patient at this stage before surgery? So, yeah, so I think that this is where you def one would definitely need a multidisciplinary team to help make that decision because it's very complicated on several uh, fronts, right? This is by no means a decision that should be made by one or two people. Um, and why do I say that? Well, the patient has, you know, symptomatic disease, which takes priority over treatment of the overall disease. So if they have a C7 lesion, this patient would have seen neurosurgery mm -hmm. and help determine, make sure there's no cord compression or threat of, um, you know, of, uh, of cord compression or any issues, because then that would be the priority. Now, in the setting of distant metastatic disease, they usually don't do surgery in that lesion. There, with, there are a couple of, of exceptions. So if it were a smaller spot without symptoms, potentially it could be watched because the patient has compressive symptoms from the anterior, from the, from the goiter of the thyroid. So they would have seen the head and neck surgeon or the endocrine surgeon and the neurosurgeon. Now, um, as well as radiation, and we would all have had a conversation as to what's the most threatening and what are the treatments. So in general, for the neck, if you're asking about, yet we ch in general, it's not very good for, sorry, radiation is not very good for uh, disease that is there in the neck because it tends to keep it stable. However, the exception why it was done in this lady was that because we could, they, they couldn't be operated on and she was having compressive symptoms. So they were trying, they didn't do a full dose, you'll notice, of radiation. They did a palliative dose. So something to sort of decrease, decrease it from growing and keep it away. But the C7 would have been addressed, you know, either simultaneously or in order, depending if it was causing problem, as would of the hip, which you can do simultaneously if that's causing um, problems. She did mention the patient had an HRAS. So that is not really targetable. There's one drug that hits HRAS that is not FDA approved called Tipifarnib. So ideally you're always looking, is there a drug that we can use to shrink the disease um, that potentially would be better than radiation so we can pull it away from symptomatic lesions. And this is a patient that we would talk um, with several people about whether or not we could use an anti-VEGF like lenvatinib mm -hmm. to help shrink it. The problem with thinking about kinase inhibitors or any drugs in general in these patients is this is a transplant patient. So again, it's complicated, right? So you don't want to necessarily give drugs to lower the immune system to have them go into dialysis. So it's a patient that's high risk for problems with the kidney, high risk from the neck and the vascular 
And so we would obviously be having conversations with the patient's nephrologist or transplant doc as well. Right. So in a multidisciplinary approach, as um, she did have acute uh, she was acutely symptomatic from the burden of the disease or the cancer. And the renal transplant, uh, which is a high-risk patient, you don't want to lose that as well by apply, applying systemic therapy. Um, can you give us some information on the HRAS mutation and uh, how frequent it is in, uh, in this type of cancer towards well-differentiated papillary? Uh, what about its frequency in follicular or healthy cell? If that was the case, are we reviewing the diagnosis, the pathological diagnosis, re-review the uh, path for, the, for this patient? So, um, yeah, so majority of mutations or alterations in differentiated thyroid cancer are in the MAP kinase pathway. So in papillary thyroid cancer, they're 40 to 70% in the BRAF or in the RAF. Um, and then the other, the rest of the majority are in the RAS category. In the RAS category, there are three RASs. There's NRAS, KRAS, and HRAS. And HRAS is the second most common. So the first most common in the RAS category is NRAS. And then second is HRAS, but it's rare. And the last is KRAS, which is also very rare. Um, and, and none of the RASs are really targetable. It's just more um, what's seen and what, what's commonly seen. They did find one drug called Tipifarnib that did uh, target HRAS, um, but it wasn't enough activity for the comp company to go forward with the drugs. Um, and what was the rest of your question? Oh, if it was um, follicular or herthal. So the new name of herthal is oncocytic, but um, herthal, oncocytic thyroid cancer typically doesn't have um, mutations uh, like RAS. Now, follicular does, and RAS is more commonly found in follicular. The question is, does it really matter in this patient if we call it papillary or follicular? And yes, you can have it re-reviewed pathologically, but it's well differentiated and your treatment at the end of the day is going to be mm -hmm. very similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So what can we move on with the video, please? That patient was started in Limvatinib as a new adjuvant therapy in September uh, 2021. And she started on full dose, 24 milligram as their recommendation, but she developed thrombocytopenia after two weeks of starting the medication. So the medication was held for one week, recovered. It was resumed at lower dose. She developed severe diarrhea after three weeks with acute kidney injury required admission for IV hydration. So it was held for another one week, recovered, resumed at lower dose, 40 milligram with PRN lipromide for her diarrhea. And it was reduced two milligram later on for worsening proteinuria, and she was maintained on it, tolerating it very well. She had, as a side effect, hypertension. She was she was started in Adelaide for that. Lisinopril added for her proteinuria and to have better control of her hypertension. She had multiple interruption of the medication while she is in it for the infection or grade to acute kidney injury. And she has weight loss, decreased appetite, fatigue most of the time, but was able to perform her daily activity. Seven months later, after the uh, starting the limbatinib, she had a follow-up imaging and biochemical uh, markers. So she has a remarkable response. Biochemically and radiologically, her TG dropped from more than 5,000 to 400 uh, milliliter. And this is her bit CT scan. You can see this is the pre-therapy. She has high knee vascular uh, goiter with extensive disease. And this is her post-therapy. Complete resolution, completed, uh, complete metabolic resolution of her goiter and all the metastatic lesion decreased in size, especially the one in the liver and the one in the transplanted kidney. And this is, as we adjust the summary, as what we mentioned, she has significant metabolic and anatomical uh, response to the lymphatinib, as well as in her CT link. So June 2022, she underwent left hemithyroidectomy, and there was no complication. It was a vascular fibrotic, a gland scam as one mass. The right tube was not removed as it was atrophied as an effect of the lymphatinib, and it was not seen on the pre-surgery uh, CT. And the pathology was reported as follicular lesion with subtotal necrosis and organization. And this is the shape of the mass. So after that, she received 
uh, 81.75 MCI in the September 2022. Okay, so we saw a remarkable um, regression of the disease. It was a big burden, uh, symptomatic, uh, patient was symptomatic from that. So here comes the beauty of uh, T uh, T uh, kinase inhibitors. Um, a brief um, information on the use of whether um, a multi-kinase or a monokinase inhibitor, Dr. al Saidi, in this case, where we don't have an identifiable target for the gene we have identified. Um, yeah, so on, I, for the audience sake and for all of us, this is extremely, extremely unusual. This is not in the guidelines. Um, this, you know, my kudos off to the team that this patient was able, and to the patient for being brave, right, and, and doing things that were completely non-traditional, and she did well, because it was a risk to the kidney, and the patient would have consented mm. to that, right? And she ended up having kidney trouble, hypertension, proteinuria, and diarrhea, right? And so we put her kidney and her at risk a lot, but she was informed, I'm assuming, right? And she decided to go forward and the team really thought outside the box. So kudos to the team. Um, in terms of, yes, lenvatinib is approved in many countries as a multi-kinase inhibitor for, especially when for any uh, differentiated thyroid cancer that's progressive and radioactive iodine refractory, right? So this patient was never proven to be radioactive iodine refractory. So in many countries, this actually would have been hard to get the drug. So again, kudos off to the team that they managed to fight and get the drug. Um, but, you know, I like the idea that they, um, sh you know, shrunk the t treated symptomatic um, areas of disease, right? So the the bones that were hurting and the neck, and then were managed to shrink it and do uh, surgery. Right, so a new adjuvant treatment prior to facilitate surgery without causing morbidity. Yeah. Uh, so let's see what has happened next. They have applied an, another modality of treatment. Uh, play on, please. The right thyroid loop was still there, although it was atrophied uh, anatomically, but there was still activity. So at that time, the, the discussion was whether this, uh, the presence of the normal right thyroid uh, deprived the other uh, intertactic lesion from the radioactive ID. So we decided to give her a chance with other uh, dose um, in six months time. So she has a follow-up imaging in January 2023, and all of the lesion showed either decrease or stable of the disease. And you can see this one. So the hair CT neck uh, in the left upper corner, this is a pre-op, and this is in January 2023. And those are the metastatic lesion in hair lung, gets smaller, and even in hair uh, uh, right stablum gets also smaller, and in the uh, transplanted kidney. Although it was done with no contrast because she, we were concerned about her renal function. And this is her bed CT scan also. This is pre-therapy. This is before she did the surgery, and this is in January 2023. So we saw initially um, a regression of the disease, but in Jan of this year, um, her condition got worse, uh, evident by the PET scan and by uh, the tumor marker as well. So now we have a patient that has responded initially to systemic uh, therapy, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, a multi-kinase inhibitor, and now worsening of the disease. And given her condition, a high risk for acute kidney injury and a high risk for um, another um, a lesion. So what would you do next, Dr. al Saidi, and what agent would you choose in this situation? So I'm sorry, uh, I think I got a little bit confused. So the patient's lenvatinib was stopped. So uh, two, two points I want to make, and then I'll ask the question. I, I thought the right lobe couldn't be found in surgery, but then on iodine scan, you see it. So that was a little confusing for me because ideally that would have all been taken out. You definitely want to remove normal thyroid tissue before considering iodine. Second is someone may ask, well, if you've already made the decision to do radiation and multi-kinase inhibitor, then why go forward with radioactive iodine? Um, but I also understand why it was done. The idea was it wasn't given initially. So therefore, if, if your goal is to try to get them off the multi-kinase inhibitor and you don't know if they're disease-desensitive, 
So this patient had surgery and then was, I'm assuming the lymphatinib was stopped, I'm mean, sorry, was stopped before surgery and then after surgery they were given radioactive iodine and lymphatinib was not restarted and then it grew, is that correct? Right, so the, that... the progression of the disease was as a result of stopping lymphatinib. Now we do not have a definition of refractory um, iodine case, iodine refractory case, um, before we start the systemic therapy. That was discovered following the first dose of radioactive iodine. So as you can see on the image, nothing picked up on the um, around 85 millicurie dose of radioactive iodine. So I think this is a, an iodine refractory case and uh, indeed the systemic therapy has worked um, initially before we diagnosed that. Um, so can we move on just to see how, how, how did she progress? She received the second dose uh, in March 2023, but her pre-therapy scan was negative, as well as post hair therapy scan. And at that time, her TG increased around 4,000, but it was because of the stimulation with TSH. And her anti-TG became positive, although it was initially negative uh, prior to initiating the lymphatinib, but later on it's become positive, which may be the lymphatinib play a role of inducing autoimmunity. So as you can see, Dr. Al-Busay, the, the iodine did not, was an avid for uh, the, the, the tissues, the, the, meta the metastases that we see were not avid for uptake, and that deems the case as a refractory to radioactive iodine. Given the complications she ran into by using lymphatinib and given her risk profile, so what agent would you use? Um, to allow a regression of the disease. So that's question number one. And question number two, is it really indicated for the second time based on the um, uh, profile that we see? So we see no um, increase in disease burden, no acute symptoms. So again, there are criteria to restart uh, systemic therapy. So can you just comment on these two questions, please? Yeah, so, um so I think that with the, the first question in terms of switching systemic therapy, I think that I, we go back to your second question, right? Which is, has she had enough progression in that amount of time, in, in a short amount of time to warrant systemic therapy and take that risk? She is not an average risk patient, as you mentioned. Um, she is a very high risk patient and you know, I always tell my patients, nobody dies of a number of the thyroglobulin. So if it's 4,000, 10,000, 1,000, I, you know, that's, that would push me. Because it is a 10 times increase is what the patients are going to tell you, right? And especially your engineers, they're, they're always worried. Um, but looking at cross-sectional imaging and PET scans and symptoms is what's going to drive it. And you're right, we didn't know that it was radioactive iodine refractory at the beginning, so we couldn't tell. Um, now, in terms of if you switch therapy. So if the patient didn't progress while on the first therapy, they didn't fail the first therapy, right? So they've progressed now off of drug, which is very common in patients that need and required a multikinase inhibitor. Once you hold it many, many times, unless you've been on it for a year or two, over two years and that things have stabilized, those that rarely happens stopping the drug, they will progress. So she hasn't quite failed the therapy. So if one yeah. felt she needed systemic therapy, then you could just restart the lymphatinib, right? But again, you're having the same discussion because she chose to come off as well, at least one of the slides had said. So, you know, you want to take, the patient should be at the center of that decision and being informed of all those potential side effects would be very, very important. Um, I think that was all you asked. Great. Dr. Um, Ramsey, Dr. Ramsey has joined us. Dr. Ramsey, any different experience with the use of uh, kinase inhibitors? Yeah, I mean, I, I must say, I will, I will, I'm really sorry. I was just asked to join. Um, this is not my area of expertise, actually. I don't, don't do thyroid cancers um, as such. I just deal with autoimmunity. So um, I don't think I've got much to add to this. It was very interesting to hear the views but it's not i'm afraid it's not my area fair enough okay so let's move on with what has happened to the patient just to mention the patient stopped the lymphatinib by herself prior the second dose to uh, two months because she get tired of it and this also can explain part of her tg increasing and this is her biochemical markers throughout her follow-up 
This is after here, it was not recorded. Uh, this is when we see here uh, in April, it was dropped significantly. And this is with each stimulation per TSH, the uh, TG will increase. And this is here anti-TG. Prior to initiation was negative, then it's become uh, positive with progressive uh, increasing. Currently, she is maintained on 10 milligram nevatinib, well tolerated, apart from worsening proteinuria, following with renal transplant team and she is an ACE inhibitor. She has partial stable response. She will return for follow up in three months with a blood work and follow up imaging. Thanks. So uh, we saw uh, a good response on lymvatinib. Um, of course, the deterioration has happened because of withdrawal of this medication. Uh, anything uh, to add on Dr. Al-Busaidi? Any clinical pearls, take home message from this case? Um, no, I think I think it was great. I, I really like how they, everybody worked in multidisciplinary mm -hmm. conference. Mm -hmm. And this was a patient that otherwise would not have done well, but the whole team thought outside the box. And, and, and I, I, I really like it. I actually don't have anything to add except, um, you know, take home pearls are, um, you know, multidisciplinary team, multidisciplinary mm -hmm. team, multidisciplinary team, and have yeah. the patient at the center of that decision. And it's great that, you know, guidelines don't answer everything. And so when you get your team around the table and, right. and talk to the patient about high risk, this was great. I'm glad she's doing well. And each time one of those scary things happened, like proteinuria and AKI, um, you know, the, the, the patient is reinformed, but yet the drug was able to be maintained and she did well. So that's nice. Excellent. Okay, so um, we'll move on to our second case. Okay, uh, I would like to thank the Arab Thyroid Association for, invita uh, for the invitation to participate in this uh, Congress, the second annual Congress. Today, my case will be about hyperthyroidism post radioactive iodine ablation. So our patient is a 60-year-old patient who is known to have a non-toxic multinodular goiter for years and who presented to the ER with chest pain and palpitation. The patient is a marathon runner and she's preparing for an upcoming marathon. She was found to have AFib in the ER. And the blood test, among other blood tests, she was found to have a suppressed TSH, although her baseline TSH was normal in the previous studies, so it was 0.04, with a normal free T4 and normal free T3. ESR and CRP were normal. On physical exam, the patient had a good blood pressure, a heart rate of 80, and her weight was stable of 59. She had an enlarged thyroid with a palpable right thyroid module. So on reviewing uh, the records of this patient, she had just done one, year, one month prior to presentation, her yearly ultrasound. And she had a nodule on the right side that was of 3.8 times 3.1 times 2.6 centimeter. It was mixed cystic and solid nodule, and it was previously FN8 in the past. Also, she had two small nodules on the left, so uh, subcentimetric, uh, 0.8 times 6, uh, 0.6 times 0.5, and the other one also, it was subcentimetric. So what we did in this patient, we did, we did a pyroid uh, scintigraphy to see what's the cause of hyperthyroidism. And actually, it showed a right toxic adenoma. So after discussing with the patient what are, uh, what are her treatment options, she decided to go for medical uh, therapy. So we started her on metimazole 5 mg daily. Two months after starting the therapy, the patient uh, presented with blood tests. So her TSH was normal and her free T4 was normal and she was doing fine. So we kept her on the same dose. And two months later, so in February, uh, her cardiologist obtained a TSH and it was a bit elevated. So the patient came to the clinic and she wanted to discuss with us what are her uh, treatment options for a definitive treatment. So she didn't want to stay on medication uh, for a long time. She wanted to see what, uh, what uh, she can do. So we gave her the option of surgery given that uh, her thyroid nodule is quite big, but she opted to go also for another uh, uh, treatment, which is the radioactive iodine. So she was given 30 millicuri on 23-323. To note that the metimazole was stopped five days prior to the radioactive iodine, and it was not resumed post the radioactive iodine. 
So the patient, uh, after one month around uh, the uh, radioactive iodine, she presented to the clinic with palpitation, dyspnea, and weight loss of 10 days uh, duration. She was hemodynamically stable, however, she was tachycardic. And her TSH was uh, quite suppressed with a high free T4. So it was the first time that her free T4 was high. It was 4.33, up to three times the upper limit of normal. However, on uh, more, uh, when we took more history from her, she reported that she had a recent viral infection a few days ago with mild sore throat. We decided to repeat the blood test to confirm that this is true hyperthyroidism and actually her free T4 was high and the TSH was still suppressed. And her ESR came to be quite high, 40. So here you can see how her TSH uh, changed over the time. So in this... Uh... So um, before, um, so this is um, um, a case of a toxic adenoma, a 3.1 centimeter toxic adenoma. Um, you know, before any definitive treatment, you need to control the thyroid toxic status of the patient by the thionamide. Uh, but what would be your next modality of management, ablation or surgery, given the size of the nodule? I think either initially would have been an option. Um, and I think this is another place where the patient kind of needs to be the center of the conversation and to discuss you know, risks and benefits in, in detail and make a decision. And it sounds like she uh, had that conversation with her providers and opted for radioactive iodine, which mm -hmm. I think was a reasonable choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was, um, she opted for the radioactive iodine treatment. Post the radioactive iodine treatment, she presented with thyroid toxic state. Uh, what would be the differential at this point? What would be we thinking of uh, post-radioactive iodine treatment? Well, it could be radiation thyroiditis. She could have a completely unrelated sort of, you know, post-viral subacute thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. You gave us that, that interesting history about her viral symptoms. Or could just be, you know, continued toxicosis. She hasn't really had necessarily enough time for the radioactive iodine to work yet. Although I would expect if that were... If it were just, just her toxic nodule without anything else on top of it, I would not have expected the, the free T4 levels to bump up so much. Right. So, um, the, unfortunately, we do not have the free T3 um, performed frequently um, in this case. Um, how would the radioactive eye, how would the thyrotropin receptor antibodies help differentiate these differentials in this case? Well, I don't think she ever had Graves' disease, so I, I'm not sure. Uh, and you know, the TPO antibodies, you know, might or might not be elevated, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't be if it's a subacute thyroiditis post-viral. So I'm not sure that would help you a whole lot here, one way or the other. Right, they they, they trap antibodies. Okay, so let's move on and see what has um, been measured in this patient. Yes, we are dealing with overt hyperthyroidism following a radioactive iodine for a toxic adenoma. And the challenge in this case was whether this was a radiation thyroiditis, was this rebound hyperthyroidism, or was it uh, simply a subacute viral thyroiditis but, uh, with, uh, that coincides with uh, the radioactive iodine? So, on the review of literature, you can see that radiation thyroiditis can occur in 1 to 5% uh, after radioactive iodine therapy. And usually it happens within two weeks of the administration of radioactive iodine. Most patients are asymptomatic, so possibly it can be underreported. And uh, the postulated mechanism of this uh, thyroiditis is the fact that radioactive iodine will induce injury to the thyroid follicular cells, which will lead to a release of so a stored thyroid hormone into the circulation. And there might be variable clinical manifestation that can go from anterior neck swelling, neck pain, tenderness, and can go up to a thyroid storm rarely. What are the risk factors of such uh, 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 entity to happen? So many studies found that in patients with grave disease, those who had a high TRAP level at diagnosis had a high risk to, uh, for radiation thyroiditis. Other studies uh, uh, found that a high dose of radioactive iodine was correlated with an increase in the, uh, in the incidence of radiation thyroiditis. However, this is very debatable in the literature. 
a high free G4 at baseline, so up to two times the, uh, the limit, uh, the, the, above, uh, the above of the range uh, limit. So it was uh, possibly uh, correlated to the incidence of uh, radiation thyroiditis. And of course, an underlying cardiovascular or cerebrovascular uh, disease was uh, correlated with a severe exacerbation of thyrotoxicosis. Here you can see also that uh, what was the role of antithyroid drugs. So uh, if we treated the patient with uh, uh, the methimazole at baseline, was it correlated with uh, protection with, uh, uh, from radiation thyroiditis? Actually, it was not. Although logically speaking, it is uh, a decrease in the intrathyroidal hormonal store should lead to a decrease in uh, the risk of radiation thyroiditis, but it wasn't. However, post-treatment with antithyroid drugs, so restarting the therapy after three to seven days uh, of uh, the radioactive iodine with a tapered dosing over four to six weeks, uh, was found to decrease the risk of radiation thyroiditis. Uh, I wanted to share with you uh, a nice uh, retrospective case record review that was done in Singapore General Hospital. So they reviewed 1,700 the 72 patient who underwent treatment uh, with radioactive iodine uh, for Graves' disease. And uh, they shared with us six uh, cases of patients who, uh, who had severe thyrotoxicosis and uh, who had a hospitalization from their thyrotoxicosis. And you can see the different uh, uh, characteristic of the patients. To note that uh, in this uh, case, so not all patients, so only three patients were hyperthyroid, they were had suppressed CSH at baseline. One patient, patient number two, had hypothyroidism and two patients were euthyroid uh, at the time of radioactive iodine. Also, you can see that they had different presenting symptoms. So some patients uh, had the typical neck pain, but other patients had myocarditis. So it was uh, myopericarditis. So it was quite uh, unusual for these patients. And uh, also uh, uh, in the study, they found that three of these patients took steroid prophylaxis before uh, the treatment because they had graves of thalmopathy, but this was not protective. What is the management of uh, toxic uh, of radiation thyroiditis? So it's the typical NSAIDs, beta blockers, glucocorticoids. However, the majority of patients are treated with a combination of antithyroid drugs and prednisolone at pre presentation. And this is because we have a challenge in establishing a definitive diagnosis of radiation thyroiditis versus a transient exacerbation of thyrotoxicosis due to the cessation of antithyroid drugs. There is uh, an interesting entity that's uh, called the new onset grave disease post radioactive iodine. So this is different from radiation uh, thyroiditis. In this case, patient might develop uh, a grave disease after radioactive iodine for toxic multinodular goiter. And this can happen in up to 4% of the patients. And this is likely due to the radiation related increase in TRAB antibodies. So we can see that the worsening of hyperthyroidism can happen following uh, the treatment with the radioactive iodine within weeks to months versus radiation related thyroiditis in one to three weeks of radioactive therapy. And in this case, we treat them with methimazole and uh, we uh, can go for a repeat radioactive iodine therapy. So this is a study that showed among 149 patients, so uh, patients who received uh, uh, radioactive iodine for toxic multinodular goiter, and the relapse group, so the 17 patients who had persistent uh, hyperthyroidism, six of them uh, had a positive trap, new onset positive trap. So at baseline, they didn't have the positive trap. And also some patients have anti-TPO antibodies at baseline. And in this study, it was found that the presence of anti-TPO, it was a marker of increased risk of developing TRAP-associated hyperthyroidism as well as hypothyroidism. So back to our case brief. Pause here. Um, so as we saw, actually we did not have a definitive diagnosis uh, upon which subsequent management was initiated. But based on the free hormones, free T3, free T4, and their ratio, how would you differentiate between thyroiditis and hyperthyroid status? And typically you're going to see a higher ratio of T3 to T4 
from hyperthyroidism, um, from the toxic nodule, or from Graves' disease, although, again, I don't think that's what this patient had, than you would um, from thyroiditis. I don't know, did we get a, a T3? But you'd expect that ratio to be um, less than a 20 to 1 in, in somebody with thyroiditis. Yeah, unfortunately, we do not have the 3T3 and even the TRAB were not available at that time. However, the subsequent management was uh, that she was started with uh, thionamide. And uh, let's just get uh, Dr. Um, Rawa on board with us to probably give us a rationale behind uh, starting thionamide um, with limited information. Dr. Rawa? Is she able to join us? One minute. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Dr. Rawa. Yes, hi. So, uh, what we did, because she had uh, this, uh, the, the possible history of uh, uh, subacute thyroiditis or the viral syndrome that she had previously, we decided to give her steroids, a small dose of steroids, because the ESR and CRP, as you can see on diagnosis, were elevated. But also, uh, because she had very high levels of the free T4, so uh, that's why uh, we gave her thionamide. Okay. Okay. So unfortunately, in this case, we do need the TRAB antibodies and the free T3 to decide whether she can be on only beta blockers or thionamide. Um, how specific are anti-TPO antibodies? You know, in many institutions, uh, the TRAB uh, results are not available. Either it could be a send-out test or, um, um, you know, uh, be lost after it has been sent for. Uh, what about the anti-TPO antibodies and uh, their, uh, if you rely on them to make a diagnosis in uh, uh, thyroid autoimmunity? Dr. Pierce? They're, they're pretty nonspecific and you have a thyroid autoimmunity expert on the panel, so I might, yeah. <laughs> might ask him to comment since this is area. Yeah, so, so in Graves' disease, around 80% will have TPO antibodies, but you still have one in five who will be negative for TPO, so I don't think it's very helpful. Uh, one question about this case, when you did the uptake scan, was it just a definite single toxic nodule or was yeah. there a diffuse uptake? Because you know, there's there's a rare case, and I've seen a couple of of grave disease with a toxic nodule. The um, if I remember correctly, is a marine Lenhardt syndrome, and it's it's uh, quite rare. But if this was a combination of the two, it would because it's very very rare to get thyroiditis after uh, radioactive iodine if you have just a toxic nodule and nothing else. So it's it's just a bit odd to me and I just wonder whether you've got a combination of the two or they developed or this person developed um, um, thyroid autoimmunity after so it's 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 an interesting case but would it be nice to have the antibodies the uh, the travel yeah. antibodies really here yes yes so remember that this case um, the the thionamide was stopped for five days prior to the ablation but it hasn't been resumed afterwards um, that's one of the risk factors for developing thyroiditis. Um, any take-home point for this uh, case as we have uh, came to an end? I think the management is, is probably what I would have done, and I would probably have been equally surprised by the degree of thyrotoxicosis following treatment, but I think the management was correct, and it sounds like she probably will do well. And I think the bigger question down the road is to sort of understand, you know, if this is a thyroiditis, her thyrotoxicosis should resolve, but it will be interesting to see where she goes next. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I must say I would have done the same. You know, th there's an argument for surgery. There's an argument for radioactive iodine. It's a patient preference. Mm -hmm. So I think everything was done absolutely fine. It's just a question of, you know, would it be nice to have a little bit more information? That That's all. But the, the patient will do well. I mean, there are no yeah. no major concerns here, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there are no cardiovascular risk factors in this case. Uh, any follow-up lab results, Dr. Rawa, for this case? So, unfortunately, no, not yet. The patient traveled immediately after the, uh, the, the thyrotoxicosis that she had, but we're expecting a follow-up soon uh, from her. But, unfortunately, no. 
we we're sure she will do better. Okay, so thanks for this case, and we move on now to our last case. Hi everyone, my name is Zaha Al Hamad. I am an endocrine fellow, and today, together with my consultant, Dr. Mahfoud, section head of endocrine department at King Faisal Specialist Hospital in Riyadh, we will be presenting a case that posed an unexpected diagnostic challenge for us. So our patient is a 31-year-old Saudi female with no significant past medical history who started to have bothersome symptoms for the past three years in the form of irritability, progressive weight loss despite a good appetite, also increased in stool frequency, heat intolerance, and palpitations. She had no visual symptoms or change in eye appearance. Since around one year, the patient symptoms got worse and also she started to develop amenorrhea and proximal muscle weakness. After which she sought medical advice in a local hospital. She was investigated and treated, but she did not feel better. But she admitted that she is not fully compliant to the therapy given. Systemic review was essentially negative apart from the previously mentioned symptoms. And regarding the drug history, she was started on two medications by her physician in the local hospital. However, she did not bring them with her and she did not recall their names. Other than that, she denied taking any other medications or supplements. Family history was negative for similar issues and socially she was living in poor socioeconomic conditions. She was single, and she finished only elementary school and then stayed at home. Now on physical examination in the clinic, the patient looked irritable and cachectic. Her weight was only 31 kg with BMI of 12. She was tachycardic with heart rate of 150 beats per minute. And then she was slightly tachypnic as well. Her hands showed a skin that was warm and moist with palmar erythema and fine tremor. An eye exam was positive for lid lag and lid retraction. Neck exam showed diffuse non-tender goiter and the thyroid gland was four times normal with no palpable nodules. She also had brisk reflexes and then evidence of proximal muscle weakness and muscle wasting but no dermopathy. Basic lab investigations showed evidence of anemia and then low albumin reflecting the poor nutritional status that she has, and also high alkaline phosphatase, which might reflect the high bone turnover state she was in. And of course, we requested thyroid function tests, which came as expected with very high levels of thyroid hormones and then suppressed TSH. So in summary, our patient is a 31-year-old female with three years history of palpitations, irritability, significant weight loss, and proximal myopathy. She was cachectic, tachycardic, having diffused large goiter with hyperreflexia and proximal muscle weakness. And then on labs, she, she was anemic uh, with evidence of malnutrition and then elevated thyroid hormones and suppressed TSH. So at this point, the diagnosis was clear for us. This patient has thyrotoxicosis. However, the question was, what's the etiology so we can address it? So as you know, um, so we have a thyroid toxic uh, patient. Um, however, clinically, she's floridly th uh, thyroid toxic. Um, this could not be simple thyroiditis. Um, one important um, um, caveat here is clinical exam can provide us with 90% of the diagnosis. So I'm not sure if we have the uh, thyroid exam. So how does it feel? What's the texture of the thyroid exam, thyroid eye disease, associated thyroid eye disease symptoms? Um, so that would give us a clue. In some institutions, you know, where they do not have the TRAB facility, TRAB lab results facility up uh, there, they would diagnose Graves' disease clinically based on um, 
the presence of uh, typically Graves' thyroid uh, goiter, uh, plus or minus uh, thyroid eye disease signs. Uh, so that's one thing to consider in order to aid in um, increasing the probability of uh, uh, type of thyrotoxic status uh, um, cl clinically. Um, so what would be the differentials at this point uh, for this thyrotoxic state? Can you play uh, the movie? We can look at the slide where it lists the differential diagnosis. Oh, there are many causes of uh, hyperthyroidism and the list includes Graves' disease, toxic multinodular goiter and adenoma, iodine-induced hyperthyroidism, thyroiditis, factitious hyperthyroidism, ectopic thyroid tissue, and TSH secreting, secreting pituitary adenoma. But the thing is, how do we differentiate between all of those? Of course, the first step in differentiating between uh, the causes of hyperthyroidism is by clinical evaluation. So as we mentioned, history and physical examination, but also we have special lab tests and then imaging that can help us in finding out the cause. So we requested some special labs, including thyroglobulin, which came back as normal. However, towards the lower side, as you can see, and then uh, antithyroglobulin antibodies uh, came positive. Anti-TPO antibodies were negative. And then one of the most important tests is TSH receptor antibodies that was unfortunately at that time not available in the hospital. So we sent it out to an outside lab. Um, so um, the panel, dear panelists, um, I do not use, really use the anti-TP or ask for anti-TP or antibodies or anti-thyroglobulin in this case. Uh, what would be your take on uh, these antibodies? Again, TRAB is the most specific and most important one, but what about the other uh, antibodies mentioned in this case? Yeah, so, so if, if I may, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the, the TP antibodies can be negative. So they are not necessarily positive. I don't request them for an overactive thyroid. I personally, um, and maybe I'm in the minority, I don't request TRAB for everybody. I only request TRAB if I'm not sure. You know, I, I've got some of my colleagues who request it for everybody. I, I don't. I'm sort of, I've got a minimalist approach. So if somebody's presenting who's got, you know, I mean, we know th this this person is thyrotoxic, had this condition for many years from what we can gather here, and has got a diffuse, smooth goiter, no nodules, then, you know, I think you're in a safe bet to say this person has got grave disease. And 80% of the patients will have grave disease um, anyway. So that's, that's the likely diagnosis here. Um, but I don't know what my colleagues think. I, I would agree. I think she has Graves' disease. You already know her. You know, she's floridly thyrotoxic. Yeah. This has been going on for three years. It's not a thyroiditis. She's young. She's got a diffusely enlarged thyroid. This is not going to be toxic multinodular goiter or toxic adenoma because that would probably be palpable in somebody who's who's young and who's this toxic. And you usually, again, don't see these levels yeah. of T3, T4 anyway. So I think it's Graves. I mean, if you put a stethoscope on and heard a brewery, you'd have a diagnosis without having to get the antibody test or the uh, goiter so that's how we make the diagnosis you know in the absence of uh, labs and provided the course of her disease a long course of her disease which was progressing not um, a stable or uh, regressed uh, as it's the case in thyroiditis subacute thyroiditis okay so let's move on with the video Imaging studies that we requested was uh, included ultrasound thyroid and then most importantly thyroid uptake and scan. And ultrasound thyroid showed an enlarged uh, thyroid hypervascular but had uh, no discrete nodules. So this is the thyroid uptake and scan. And as you can see here at four hours, there's very faint tracer uptake and specifically, the calculated uptake was 0.3%, uh, while it was closer to 0% at uh, 24 hours. 
So what do you think is going on? Yeah, can you pause? So um, hyperthyroidism with negative uh, uptake and scan, differential diagnosis. So the first question is, has she had ex you know, exogenous iodine exposure recently? Has she had a mm -hmm. CT scan? Is she taking high-dose supplements? Right. Um, in which case, you might not see any thyroidal uptake. And the other thing that I would think about is perhaps doing a whole body scan and looking at the pelvis um, for a, you know, a teratoma. Right. So uh, how would the thyroid globulin um, help us in this situation? A negative scan? Um, yeah, so that's the other thing in the differential uh, would be that this is exogenous uh, thyroid hormone. That sort of high thyroid globulin uh, would help you, but she's got the thyroid globulin antibody. So although I think her thyroid globulin level was inappropriately normal for somebody who's making exogenous high levels of thyroid, sorry, endogenous high levels of thyroid hormone um, in the presence of the antibody, that's not very meaningful. Right. So a normal one wouldn't uh, be helpful, but a suppressed thyroid globulin would be helpful in this case. Um, move on, please. One here. So here is a list of the differential diagnosis of thyrotoxicosis with low radioactive iodine uptake. And the list includes thyroiditis, exogenous thyroid hormone intake, iodine-induced hyperthyroidism, and then ectopic hyperthyroidism. On the other hand, uh, the causes of thyrotoxicosis with high radioactive iodine uptake include Graves' disease, autonomous thyroid tissue, and TSH-producing pituitary adenoma. So at this point, after all of those labs and then uh, investigations and imaging, what would be your next move? For us at that time, we elected to repeat the scan just to make sure that there is no ectopic foci. As you can see here, the whole body scan was negative. And also, we emphasize to the technician uh, to supervise uh, that the patient takes the radioactive iodine material. And then the thyroid scan again showed low uptake. Uh, as you can see, the 24 hours uh, uptake was calculated to be only 2.4%, with a normal uptake at 24 hours uh, was 15 to 35%. So we've ruled out a couple of uh, differentials here. So it's not an ectopic, it's not um, factitious. Um, one point on the iodine-induced. The iodine-induced can present with high uptake scan or a low uptake scan, depending on uh, how recent the iodine administration was. So can you give us some uh, information or shed some data on that, please? I would typically expect, I mean, you need really high iodine intake to cause, you know, low radioactive iodine uptake in, in somebody who truly has, you know, endogenous uh, excess thyroid hormone production. So it's going to be something you can usually ascertain on history. History. Um, right. So by careful history, because that could be tricky and it could be, uh, it could go either ways, either high or a low uptake. So detailed history um, is, is the key here. Um, can you move on with the video, please? It's worth to mention that at this point, we got the TSH receptor antibodies results and the TSI index was a positive 1.4 while uh, the, the negative results for TSI index was less than 1.3. So do you think that uh, all of those investigations and then two scans are enough to get the diagnosis? Are we getting any closer to the diagnosis or are we missing something? So any clues here? Interesting. Um, that, that's for sure. I mean, the the history, as I said, was very suggestive that this is Graves. Um, the uptake is a bit also. We we definitely we show that there was no procedure, nothing that to cause that. So there, there's no such thing. Um, 
Well, I don't know, uh, actually. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit taken mm -hmm. aback. I, 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 I don't know what else to suggest at this stage. I might get a urinary iodide concentration here. Um, and this is very rarely useful in the clinical setting. Um, by and large, you can't diagnose iodine deficiency, for example, with a urinary iodine. But it would tell us for sure if she's had some kind of exogenous high iodine load that she doesn't know about, for right. example, in cases of hamburger thyrotoxicosis that have been reported. Right, so that's one um, uh, clue here for um, um, any exogenous intake of iodine. Um, so uh, by history, I mean, there was no uh, positive uh, alluding into the fact that she has received uh, uh, um, iodine uh, administration. Even the records that does not mention that she has underwent a recent cath or um, a recent image. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the urinary iodine content, 24-hour urine iodine is, uh, is um, a helpful tool. Any other possibilities? So, so can I just ask, was there a repeat of her thyroid function at any stage? Yeah, so it was persistently um, suppressed TSH and elevated free T3, free T4 with the same ratio as she presented initially. So consistent thyrotoxic state in favor of Graves' disease provided the course and the level of free hormones. And, and clinically, she's thyrotoxic. Still, she's clinically thyrotoxic. And her, her free T3 and T4 were both above assay, right? So we don't have any additional information about ratios? The uh, ratios were suggestive of Graves. Further ratios uh, were done following uh, the administration of the next step of management. So here, I can maybe reveal the mystery here. Um, it was a very experienced clinician who has uh, uh, thought of the procedure itself, the way the procedure was done. So eventually the patient has not been swallowing the uh, tracer, the technician tracer. And uh, let, let's see what Dr. Um, um, uh, Hamad would reveal further into that. So play on the video, please. I will leave this question to the panel for discussion. Thank you. Mark, are you um, on board with us? Is she available? Yeah. Okay. Doctor Ashwak. Hi, Doctor Ashwak. Okay, tell us, please. So, um, what was the a procedure uh, in scan number one, scan number two, uptake and scan number three. Okay, so during the scan uh, number one, uh, the patient did not take the capsule at all. Uh, she said she has some difficulty in swallowing capsules and she, she don't like to take uh, pills. Uh, but this procedure was unsupervised. So the second scan, uh, we emphasized to the radiologist, uh, the radiologist technician, to supervise the patient. And he asked the patient after giving the pill to open her mouth, and he found nothing. However, uh, we found out later that she was hiding it under her tongue. So maybe some of it got absorbed and we, we got the 2.4% uptake. Uh, now, during the third scan, it was under physician supervision we confirmed the swallowing by asking the patient to open her mouth and lift her tongue. And uh, then we took the, the scan after four hours. And if I can share the screen. Yeah, show us scan share, number three, please. To share the third scan. Kudos to the clinician who figured this out because I, I have never encountered this. It would have occurred to me that this was an option. And look at what the title uh, states, Perseverance and Common Sense Prevails. So and I guess in th even in thyroid cancer, <laughs> here you go. So that's the proper scan. That's the proper uh, procedure. 
Yeah, showing intense, intense homogeneous uptake within both thyroid lobes and the calculated 24 hours uptake was 76%. And the whole body scan was uh, negative also. Yeah, so, so that's to rule out uh, ectopic. Excellent. Yes. Can, I, can I just make a comment here? I mean, this is, um, I feel better now with my minimalist approach because I don't think I would have done an optic scan to start with. You know, you've got a v pretty classical history. You've got a homogeneous, really big enlargement of the thyroid. What else can it be? It, it will be grave disease. So um, I, I don't think I would have done an optic. I only do optic when I'm not sure what's going on. So mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. um, you know, how can I put this sort of routine test sometimes can get some very confusing results. It's a fantastic case. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I think it's fantastic. And hats off to the physician who made made the diagnosis. I remember this for the rest of my career. Hat that's for sure. Off, hat that off. So I, and I might have got the TSI, but actually the ATA guidelines would not recommend getting the radioactive iodine uptake and scan here. You know, um, they, they would recommend the, the TRAB as the first step. Mm -mm. So even taking a slightly less minimalist approach, if you just waited for that TSI to come back, you could have spared yourself all this aggravation, but then you wouldn't have had such a great case to present. Right, so that just to list up the differentials, again, as you said, clinically, by the presence of goiter and the course of her disease was not improving. Usually, thyroiditis would um, uh, improve um, with or without, you know, symptomatic treatment with beta blockers. Um, yeah, I usually, if, if clinically wasn't evident, I would order TRAP, and if it comes back positive, I wouldn't care about ordering an uptake and a scan in this case. Um, so any information or where is the uh, use, proper use of the TSI index here, difference between TSI index and the TRAB, uh, which one is more specific uh, in this case? I mean, the, the TSI is going to be looking at just, you know, specifically stimulating uh, antibody, whereas uh, some TRAB is just looking at binding and could be both inhibitory um, or uh, or stimulating. But in somebody who's hyperthyroid, you sort of know it's going to be stimulating regardless. So I think in a patient like this, it doesn't matter a whole doesn't lot. It doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Any comments from our experienced panelists? Um, so, so you can have both actually as well. So when you have TRAB binding antibodies, you can have stimulating and blocking antibodies. And I had a very interesting case in a gentleman who used to fluctuate between the stimulating and the blocking antibodies. So we go over and underactive, and we had to ablate the thyroid. But um, so the the trap is just, you know, um, as it was explained just earlier, it's it's a binding test could be stimulating or uh, blocking. Um, but in this case, it's it's pretty clear cut, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments on this case? Fascinating case. Okay, I guess so. We came to an end uh, of um, the grand rounds. Thank you, our panelists. And uh, it was a wonderful discussion and listing of differentials and uh, different uh, sort of management modalities on these three cases. And thank you to our presenters. And um, we will move on now next to our third session. I hand in the stage to my colleague, Dr. Alisa. Thank you.